The Umber Witches. The dark side to the balance of the universe, more or less the right eye. These witches are commonly seen using the power of hell, in tandem with their hair, to summon demons, fists, and anything in between to eliminate the virtues and angels. And even with the light, the light can still be corrupted. Bayonetta. A factor of true hope to take down the last of the Lumen Sages, ending this chaotic, seemingly balanced bound to happen. One of the last Umber Witches of her time, Bayonetta simply is quested to bounty hunt any angels, virtues, or light monsters in her way. And really, she does so in style. But what is Bayonetta? Why do her clothes... I'm not gonna ask that question. Who are the Lumen Sages? <laughs> what makes this game such a real gore fest? And why is Luca the best character in the game? Who were and who are? The Umber Witches. I welcome you to the review of Bayonetta, a first in a not so soon to be three game series, following the combo and hacking and slashing of a female fatale Bayonetta. Now, without further ado, let's let the shadow remain cast. The opening of Bayonetta shows a nun over the grave of our seemingly main character, with a somewhat mourning New Yorker who I really had to get familiar with due to my amount of stone trophies to start. And that guy is the one and only Enzo. I mean, in the main game, he's shown like twice. But as the scene continues, these bird angels with spears begin to raid the party, and as they slowly approach, this nun, she really gets angry. Mad enough to even pull out guns and lay them out. I mean, this is an awesome reveal to the main protagonist, and altogether pulls an awesome trick, showing what topics this game is willing to distort as well. After the nun, also known as Bayonetta, runs out of ammo, getting introduced to my boy Rodin. And no, it's not Rodon. Dummy Enzo. This first scene is absolutely badass, and with a remix of one of the best songs of all time to complement it, I really welcome you to the first battle. This introduces the layouts of gameplay, but post battle, you're hinted further into the main story, which I'll summarize with the least amount of spoilers possible. I mean, this game has a super deep lore and basically its own mythology, so I'd rather not be here for hours, thanks. At least not on Bayonetta 1. To put it straight, 500 years ago, the balance between the Lumen Sages and the Umber Witches was broken, where the Light attempted to capture the Right Eye, or basically the factory reset of the world. There was an Umber Witch who had caused this by having a cursed child with a Lumen Sage, causing the Right Eye of Dark begin to be attacked, and in the end, the Umber Witch cursed child escaped with the Eye. This brought about the constant hunt and made angels begin to spread around the world of Bayo to recapture this Eye, and eventually just reset the world. The normal human reality we all know, that gets repercussions without the weird angels, and the other reality, where it's really the same, but with vicious angels. The one where the angels is is where combat takes place. After these events, the Umber Witch is won, leaving one Lumen Sage left. Bayonetta, after being in a constant slumber for 500 years, after these events, bursts from her grave that a diver had found, which she accidentally kills the diver and reawakens to follow her quest of taking down the virtues and finding the last living Lumen Sage, to effectively eliminate him and bring balance by letting both eyes just, you know, kinda exist. Bayonetta begins to slowly regain her powers throughout the game, and along with the help of her rival, Jean, who's banded with the light, she begins to pull back her memories and redevelop her powers throughout the course of the game, getting closer to taking down the voice in her head and saving the child that she runs into. I mean, this game does this amnesia cliche pretty well. One character I'd like to mention that is introduced early enough without spoilers is Luca. The child to the father Bayo accidentally killed by waking up from her coffin. Now, Luca is voiced by the same guy who does Peter Parker in Spider-Man, and who boy, do I actually really like Luca's character. At first, he just seems like a vengeful Prince Charming, but as semi-spoiler, the child, Cereza, is introduced, his character begins to evolve and find the truth behind what Bayonetta is doing. He's a journalist, and knowing the mythology of this game, he actually understands what's happening when he takes care of Cerecita, and begins to see Bayonetta as the Umber Witch not a father killer. I mean, don't get me wrong, he still holds it, but he begins to see what's happening really, and in the end realizes what really killed his father. I love his character development a lot, and to be honest, I would say he's the best made character in the game. Now, that's really touching the surface of this story, but altogether the main gameplay in this chapter-based hack and slash is similar to the story of Monster Hunter, and this holy book of monsters keeps this game's mythological feel consistent and in the end it feels like I was going through Greece or something of the sort, even in the UI in the shop being the Gates of Hell. And talking about Gates of Hell, let's cover that real quick. Run by Rodin, the best boy. This bar is basically the shop where you'll find all goodies that you'll need, be that weapons, even though they'll be free during the story unless it's a secret weapon, heals or power-ups in the forms of lollipops, artifacts to help you destroy the enemies, or Rodin's treasures, which really are just costumes. 
On the Switch where I played it, there's a cool bonus you get free costumes. Four of them, themed on Link, Peach, Daisy, and Samus, which basically give just reskins. Link's outfit changes the katana to the Master Sword and has the rings turned into rupees, and it's nice to replay chapters with a new style. Anyway, rings are earned basically throughout the game and can be turned into Rodin, hint, buy as many red hot shots as there are available. Those are really just revives. Okay, now I want to cover about how this game distributes itself and has a little of the world before we dive headfirst into gameplay. Each chapter, excluding boss, has its own array of puzzles, playstyles, power weapons, and open levels. The chapters follow more or less a Kingdom Hearts, Sonic 06 style of world, making it a pretty nice experience to explore. Sometimes more than not, they do feel a bit linear and control your style and camera, but altogether, the usual combo experience is really satisfying. The world, especially when the design and cutscenes has a cool film reel to it, has a nice stylistic feel. It doesn't do the game as much justice as some of the fully animated cutscenes, but it does definitely give a cool theme. As the game continues, the film reels begin to become more full cutscenes. I mean, it's a cool idea, and it's maybe nice to put in the PS section of the letter. The fully made cutscenes are definitely the better ones. Aside from that, the game has a more bland coloration to it most of the time, and once in my life, or I will say, it actually works well. The entire bit of world building and magic creates a nice complementary balance and altogether creates a good world of the space for innovative ideas which are brought on by the clobbering and smashing gameplay. If you've ever played a hack and slash before, this game is kinda like it, just a lot more focused on combos. It's definitely a lot closer to the Devil May Cry series, with a bit more focus on all ranges, and specifically magic. Bayonetta is really cool in the fact that it rewards you for doing combos. Basic attacks give you low damage, but as you chain them, basic attacks grow in damage, leading to an end of a combo dealing a huge amount. There's also a point score, and if you like that combo, it can be shown to the right near the verse section. I never really was a combo man, and the array of weapons altogether made comboing fun for me. Even button mashing, with control may I add, ended up making cool combos, both ranged and close combat. Now none of this would have been able to be tested if the super fast paced gameplay was it, and similar to Nier Automata, you need to dodge. Bayonetta by far is better in this way though, and similar to a perfect shield in Smash, you're rewarded for your timing. And taking from Bayo's actual Smash move set, we were beautifully given access to Witch Time, basically a way to lay damage in without damage being laid back into you. I mean, I absolutely adore the idea of Witch Time, and by Jubilius did a clutch me in for most of the playthrough. Even though you know, I may have gotten mostly stone statues? I have more, more on that later. The one peeve I have with Witch Time is that sometimes it just doesn't activate. It'll do the slowdown to make it look like it's going to, but especially when fighting Durga, it just kinda doesn't activate, and in the end had me killed about 7 more times than I really needed. Something I absolutely adored though was the magic bar and torture attacks. It just spices everything up, and seeing a gory torture attack appear is such a satisfying feeling, to the point where you feel evil in the best ways. From the gallows to the guillotine, Bayo just summoned <laughs> to dominate everything. Boss fights consist of cinematic coliseums and war bases and makes everything feel important. Most bosses and mini bosses created a new feel and really felt special per battle. Something I have to compliment about this game is bosses are actually sized correctly. Most games always have exclusively giant bosses, and yeah, while that works, it doesn't feel as natural as Bayo's did. The sizing feels just right. The bosses may also have a climax to end off their fight, and this just brings out Bayonetta's personality in so many ways by summoning the demons from the actual gates of hell to bring down the enemies put in front of her. I absolutely adore this. It's like a torture attack, but really, a torture attack on crack. It was adapted into Smash as well too, and so happy am I. At the end of each verse and chapter, you get medals and trophies respectively based on how well you did. I was absolutely trash, but if it's your style, as it is slowly becoming mine, 100%ing and replayability made a staple in my mind. It enforces replaying the chapters, but for my main playthrough, I didn't really want to go back. It may have been beneficial to go back, but it didn't motivate me and my million stone statues to. Now, this may be just me, but for some reason, certain portions of the game have places that really just feel imbalanced. Most of the time, this is fine and dealable, but bigger enemies sometimes feel unavoidable without witch time, and it never really tells you when you're gonna lose this ability. This in most situations really just bugged me but comboing a bird gladiator isn't the only sort of gameplay. There's two other notable ways you get to play in Bayonetta, specifically the ones I'll look at are bike and rocket. Both of these really just feel fitting, but nowhere near as fun as the original combat. You just kinda continuously fire and dodge on both of these, and that's why I haven't played Star Fox yet. I mean, obviously Star Fox would polish this style, but in Bayonetta it only fits due to magic, but 
really just feels out of place. Their controls aren't the best either, it feels a bit too floaty for my liking compared to the grounded style of most of the game. I digress, it does fit nice into the story and the lore. Shying away from the negatives, can I really just say music? Nothing else, just music. I always mention that the Persona series has my favorite soundtracks of all time, and really still so, but man, does Bayonetta really challenge that? It's melodic, and it's- and honestly, the lyrical songs, even though they're covers, they feel just way better than anything like Bioshock Infinite. Well, I mean, yeah, Bioshocks fit better with the theming of the game, Bayonetta's feels like it's something that the main characters themselves were listening to constantly. Bayonetta's character development was tremendously brought to light by the jazzy themes of beautiful Frank Sinatra covers, and her naughty talk really benefited from this. This brought her confidence to light, and full-on made the game feel centered around her. Now, after that, this brings me to my last point of this game. The flow of just everything. The music feels in line with what gameplay is challenging you with, and the flow of Bayonetta's sexual personality is complemented by a kiss to open a gate or pickup line before a fight. The personality of this game really comes from the flow, and even though the magic comes from Bayonetta's hair as she <coughs> has something happen, it complements the overall feel of confidence through a dark world taken over by light. Rodin's character, Luca's personality, Jean's rivalry, the character design, specifically clothing, makes everything feel glued together, and with a bit more polish could have been perfect. It's still really good, don't get me wrong, landing in the upper echelons, but the design had a smidge missing. But that's fine, because without this development, the flow of the game wouldn't have been the same. I give this flow a good firm handshake for how good it is. Now Bayonetta, the first game, was a different type of game than I'm used to, and unsurprisingly caused controversy during its release. Yet I mean, after playing it, its more mature theme made everything flow together in such a fun and expiring way. Its lore provided many options for the game to explore, and makes the gameplay combos really fun. My stone statues and I adored the theming all around, making this game a joy to see the progression of. Though some portions may feel out of place or a bit imbalanced, the entire experience all around was a really enjoyable story. Fly me to the moon, let me play among the stars. A second time. Let me give this game a rating of 8 points out of 10. In other words, the game stays true. <laughs> In other words, this game is crispy. <laughs> It's a bit missing. The theme and lore open up so many opportunities while still trying to address something that the theme would struggle a bit from time to time with. I mean, the Blender color scheme somehow made this charming game really good, with its abundance of corrupted angels. In all, Bayonetta was just a great experience, and with some polishing all around, leaves potential for an absolutely astonishing game. I mean, judging from my copy, I have an odd feeling Bayonetta 2 could possibly be one of my favorite games I've played as of the recent years. I mean, I guess we'll just have to see. But for now, au revoir. FLY ME TO THE MOON!